So Andrew, just before we get started, I just want to confirm, are you okay um, presenting or would you wish that we present? And just then you can just say next slide. I, I, I think my, it might be me safer if, uh, if you present at all. We'll, we'll just ask to advance slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair. It is 7 o'clock. We can now proceed, and we will confirm quorum uh, uh, during roll call. Thank you uh, very much, uh, City Clerk. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, our special uh, meeting of Brampton's Planning and Bombing Committee. Uh, our first is approval of the agenda. We have a motion moved by Council Fortini to approve the agenda, that the agenda for the Planning Development Committee meeting of May 16th. Uh, or my apologies, May 30th be approved. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Declaration of interest. Uh, do any members have declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Mr. Any matter to be yes. Um, before we proceed further, I think we should just do a roll call just to confirm the members that are present. My apologies. I, I guess I was too eager to discuss the Brandon plan. So over to you, City Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, members of committee, I will call your name. Please indicate your presence in tonight's special meeting. Councillor Santos. Present. Councillor Vasante. Present. Is present in person. Councillor Willens. I do not see present at the moment. Uh, Councillor Pileschi. Present. Councillor Bowman. Present. Is present in person. Councillor Williams. Good evening. I'm here. Councillor Fortini. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Present. Councillor Dillon. Good evening here. Thank you. And I'll just go back. Councillor Willens. Councillor Willens. All right. Fire it on, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. And Chair Medeiros is present. So all 10 members are present, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do any members have declaration of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Seeing none, the clerk will so note for the meeting minutes. Uh, our next uh, statutory public meeting report. Um, this is a public meeting of the Planning and Development Committee held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act of Ontario. The proposals to be heard at this public meeting are the result of applications made under uh, the Planning Act. Uh, there are no, uh, there are not proposals um, of the City of Brampton, less specifically identified as city-initiated proposals. So today we do have one city-initiated proposal for a statutory public meeting, uh, the new draft Brampton plan. The intent of the public meeting is to receive submissions from the public regarding these proposals. Given we may have persons watching this meeting through the city's live stream, we will have staff present each proposal subject to a statutory public meeting unless committee decides otherwise. After receiving any delegations, members of the committee may ask uh, questions for clarification, but will not engage in debate on the proposal at this time. Committee consideration of the proposal will occur at a future meeting when planning staff bring forward the final recommendation report on each proposal. The city also has posted to its website supporting information and documentation for these public applications for public review and, and uh, reference. We will now proceed to consider the one item on today's, on this evening's statutory public meeting agenda. 
uh, which is uh, 4.1 stock report regarding Brampton plan. And I will now hand it over to Andrew McNeil from our Planning, Building, Economic Development uh, Department. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much, Chair Medeiros and uh, members of, of the Planning and Development Committee, uh, members of the public and, and members of, of staff that have joined us this evening. We appreciate you taking the time out from this beautiful evening to, to be in attendance uh, for, for Brampton Plan. As, as the Chair mentioned, this, uh, this meeting is a statutory public meeting to consider Brampton Plan. Um, the Brampton Plan, draft Brampton Plan, has been posted on the City's website for over a month now. And this meeting has been advertised according to the Planning Act, the timelines, and advertising mechanisms that are required uh, as per the Planning Act. Next slide, please. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathering here today on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and before them, the traditional ter territory of the Haudenosaunee, uh, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other global Indigenous people that now call Brampton their home. We are honoured to live, work, and enjoy this land. Next slide, please. The agenda for today, uh, we would like to uh, provide a, a high-level presentation of the foundations of Brampton Plan, city structure that is proposed within the plan, our strategy to build an urban city as per the direction uh, outlined in the 2040 vision that was adopted in, in 2018 by Council, the citywide building blocks that are contained within the plan, as well as provide an overview of next steps following today's statutory public meeting, and then at the end of the meeting, provide an opportunity for any questions and answers that, that may, be, uh, may be requested on the, on the part of the public. Next slide, please. The objectives of today are to provide an overview of how the plan has been developed, introduce the draft Brampton plan that has been on the city's website for over a month, and seek, seek feedback from the public um, on the draft plan that has been prepared. Um, we have already begun to receive feedback on the plan, and we've already begun to make some changes. So what we anticipate uh, is when this plan comes forward to Council later on this year, in, in July, um, that we will be bringing forward a comment matrix that incorporates all the feedback that we received today, as well as that we have already received, um, and we will also deliver a track change version of Brampton Plan. Next slide, next slide please. <clears throat> With respect to the foundations of Brampton Plan, next slide. And I'm not, yeah, there we go. Uh, Brampton Plan is the highest level official document within the city of Brampton. It informs uh, all planning uh, underneath it in terms of secondary plans, precinct plans, area studies, and as well guides implementation documents such as the zoning bylaw and urban design guidelines. Brampton Plan has been created to implement the direction that Council uh, wished to see as part of the 2040 vision. And following adoption of Brampton Plan, the City will move quickly to update the zoning bylaw and urban design guidelines and bring those forward early in 2023. Um, as Council has, has heard and the public has heard on numerous occasions, we are required under the Planning Act to conform and be consistent with the Region Appeals Official Plan as well as provincial policy and legislation. As part of our background work for the development of Brampton Plan, we conducted a conformity exercise to ensure that we are uh, conforming and consistent with these upper level government documents. Um, and as many members of council are aware, um, the Region of Peel recently adopted their official plan that is currently with the province for approval. Um, following approval of Brampton Plan, it will go to the region for approval. Uh, and timing is to be determined. Next slide. Um, as we've mentioned on numerous occasions, the direction, the foundation for the update of Brampton Plan was really the 2040 vision, which articulated uh, a shift in direction for the city of Brampton, really moving away from rapid, low-density, sprawl-type development, auto-centric development, and building a complete, urban, vibrant place. There were seven key directions that were articulated in the 2040 vision. We have maintained the integrity of those directions in Brampton Plan. 
However, we have modified them slightly uh, to reflect the priorities that were identified through consultation, but the integrity of those uh, building blocks remains in Brampton Plan. Next slide. Uh, we have conducted a robust community engagement process, and we do view the 2040 vision as the first stage of engagement of Brampton Plan. Uh, that was really setting the vision, um, and Brampton Plan was about testing the vision, refining the vision, and making sure that it was implementable. Uh, we are now in the fifth phase of Brampton Plan, which is the statutory public meeting. We also held two public open houses on, on May 18th and May 19th that were reasonably well attended. Uh, the next stage following today's meeting uh, are to make any changes that are required and then bring uh, the final plan forward to Planning and Development Committee on July 6th. Next slide, please. With respect to an overview of Brampton Plan, uh, it is organized around four chapters. The first chapter one is articulating the vision, uh, where, where we want to take Brampton in the next 30 years. Um, we talk about where we've been, where we've come from, the successes that we're building upon, the challenges that we may face, um, and the key direction where we want to go over the next 30 years to the planning horizon of this plan, which is 2051. Chapter two are the details, the policies that will guide growth and investment over the next 30 years. Chapter three are some of the tools that we can use uh, to implement the policies and realize the city that we're looking to create. Chapter four are the site and area specific policies. We've conducted a thorough review of the current site and area specific policies contained within the current Enforce official plan. Uh, a number have been carried forward, but a number have been removed as they are no longer required. And then finally, are a series of schedules that complement the, the verbal language set out in chapters two and three to help provide clarity around the policies within Brampton Plan. Next slide, please. With respect to city structure, this is an important organizing element that will guide and direct growth. Next slide. We have con created the city structure based on the feedback that we have heard from the community, um, as well as through the 2040 vision. Uh, some of the key things that, that we heard were top of mind for folks in the city of Brampton. Affordable housing, I think, is top, top of the list for a lot of people, not only in Brampton, but right across southern Ontario and, and Canada-wide. Um, transit, higher order transit, how do we make it easier for people to get around the city? Uh, protection of green natural areas, climate change, managing growth in a manner that's contextually sensitive, contextually appropriate, so that we can preserve what's great about Brampton today, a lot of the existing communities, but also absorb a lot of growth in a respectful and complementary way, and then attracting jobs. Uh, we understand the desire to increase the activity rate um, and achieve more jobs so that people can live and work closer to home. Next slide, please. Some of the benefits from the city structure. Um, we are looking to create a structure that can absorb a, a tremendous amount of growth. We are looking at, over the next 30 years at between three and 400,000 new residents coming to live in the city of Brampton. That is essentially a population the size of the city of Vaughan being inserted into the city of Brampton. So it's important that we guide this growth in a respectful, sustainable, um, and appropriate manner that we get the desired results uh, and build a truly vibrant and great city. Uh, it's important that we anticipate what that kind of growth means for Brampton in terms of getting around and really directing a lot of the growth to around areas that can be serviced by higher order transit. Um, the car will still be important in the city of Brampton, but other modes, active transportation, walking, cycling, transit, are going to increase in terms of their priority over the next three decades and beyond. We also want to ensure the long-term financial sustainability of Brampton, setting Brampton up for success. Uh, we've learned from other cities. Uh, we can continue to learn from other cities. Um, low density development um, can be financially challenging for cities in the long term. 
So we're looking to intensify and ensure that we're um, receiving revenues that outpace um, costs as we grow. Uh, so growing smartly uh, will have a direct impact on the financial sustainability of the City of Brampton. We want to ensure that we're inclusive in everything we are, do we are doing, that we're celebrating our diversity. It truly is an asset and a strength for the City of Brampton. We want to go smarter and healthier. There's a direct correlation between the way we grow and how healthy and happy our residents are. Uh, so we want to learn from best practices and incorporate that into how we grow over the next three, three decades. Um, central to all of this is minimizing the need to try to travel long distance between live and work and undertaking a lot of your, your daily needs. So really reducing the need to travel long distances by focusing on compact, mixed use, walkable uh, and vibrant development is really important to the city's future. Uh, affordability, we mentioned earlier, is, is top of the list for many folks uh, in, in our city. Um, so how can we learn from, from what others are doing uh, we have a Brampton housing strategy that we are looking to implement through Brampton Plan. And then uh, of critical importance to all of us is how we deal with climate change and ensure that, that Brampton is doing its part. And one of the number one uh, contributors to greenhouse gas um, is transportation. So we want to ensure that the city we are building um, provides more sustainable and environmentally uh, sustainable ways of folks getting around or minimizing the need to travel, which will have a direct result on minimizing greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. With respect to the city structure, we have tried to um, create a plan quite different from previous plans where we look at horizontally integrating a lot of the traditional disciplines that you will find uh, contained within um, municipal official plans. So we tried to take an integrated approach to transportation planning, land use planning, economic development, environmental sustainability. Um, and that really um, requires to look at the city in a different way. Um, so all of this comes together in a coordinated way where we incorporate city centers, boulevards, corridors, neighborhoods, employment areas, natural heritage systems with the mobili mobility framework that gives us what is Brampton Plan. Next slide. <clears throat> The city structure, the proposed city structure that's contained within Brampton Plan is, as, as discussed earlier, uh, a way of directing growth in a manner that can absorb the tremendous volume of growth that we are going to see over the next three decades. The red circles are the key urban centers, uptown, downtown, Bramalee, connected by the key transit spines on Queen Street here, Ontario. That is where we want to direct uh, most of the growth uh, over the next three decades but there is still a tremendous amount of growth that will occur in Greenfield. Uh, Heritage Heights is one of the largest areas that will absorb a, a significant amount of growth, up, uh, upwards of a third of, of the growth over the next three decades. But we also want to direct uh, growth outside of the urban core, downtown, uptown, uh, Bramley, to town centers so that we are starting to deliver satellite complete communities that are all transit focused. And there are a number of town centers that we're looking at. Ramgo is a strategic uh, town center located along the CN rail line that connects to downtown Kitchener-Waterloo uh, Union Station. So that whole CN rail corridor, which is the diagonal green line, is a strategically very important asset for the city of Brampton moving forward. Other town centers such as um, Ram West, um, Heritage Heights, uh, Bram East, etc., these are areas where we want to pay uh, a significant amount of attention to um, and make sure that we can create urban alternatives for people to live and work within the city of Brampton. The goal of this is to catalyze uh, employment offerings here uh, outside of the conventional employment base that has been built in the city of Brampton to really try and keep people living and working within Brampton and also to, to, to try and be a net importer uh, of people working to the city of Brampton. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea Celeste, who's going to talk about our strategy to build an urban city. Andrea? Thank you, Andrew. So the next series of slides, we're going to be talking a little bit more in more detail 
uh, in terms of the urban structure elements uh, that Andrew just walked us through. Um, and it's all part of our strategy to build an urban city. Next slide, please. So critical to the city's growth management strategy, um, as Andrew mentioned, are the centers and boulevards, and they are intended to accommodate uh, a lot of the city's growth. And that's because they're well served by transit. Um, they provide opportunities for redevelopment at a scale, uh, a greater scale than other places in the city. Um, and, and the objective here is to have a critical mass in uh, certain areas so that we're creating uh, more walkable communities. Mind you, um, the, the objective throughout uh, Brampton is really to create walkable communities where we can. Um, centers and boulevards are envisioned as uh, vibrant, attractive, urban places. That means the form will be urban too. Um, they're going to be places for people to gather with lots of options for activity. Um, and in support of this objective, the official plan um, emphasizes placemaking and has a, a pretty robust uh, section slash chapter on design excellence because we want places and spaces to be beautiful so people want to get out and walk around. Next slide, please. Another important element to the city structure are corridors. So corridors, as Andrew mentioned, are key linkages. Um, and they're along streets that are served by uh, the transit network, the rapid transit network. Um, similar to centers and boulevards, there's going to be a broad mix of uses. But the form uh, along corridors are, are predominantly mid-rise. And the reason for that is that they provide a transition between um, the, the higher intensity forms in centers and boulevards, the taller buildings, um, to the low-rise forms in neighborhoods. And we're going to talk about neighborhoods in a moment. Um, and similar to uh, centers and boulevards, there's an emphasis on an enhanced public realm in all of these areas because, again, we want to promote active transportation and, uh, and, and activity. Um, we've talked a little bit about, we've talked quite a bit about urban structure. Uh, Mixed-use districts, that's a land use designation. Um, and that's on another schedule of the official plan when you're looking through it. So um, Andrew had the urban structure plan uh, on the slide there. And um, you, you know, on another schedule of the plan, you, you'd see the land use designations. Um, and this land use designation, the intention is to implement the city's urban structure. Um, mixed use districts are concentrated around primary major transit station areas. And the intention is to do exactly what it sounds like. They're going to accommodate a mix of uses, um, but um, they will be supported by area studies, uh, major transit station area studies. They're going to uh, provide further direction for these districts through uh, a planning framework and, of course, supported by further public consultation and studies. Next slide, please. So neighborhoods, um, if you uh, recall the urban structure plan that Andrew had on the screen, they comprise a large um, pop uh, proportion of the city uh, and it includes the lower scale fabric, the existing fabric, the residential um, areas, but kind of moving away from that traditional approach to the idea of neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhoods in the Brampton plan context includes locally serving uh, commercial and institutional uses at a lower scale than um, you would see in a corridor as an example. Uh, one of the um, one of the many objectives of Brampton Plan is to achieve 15-minute neighborhoods where you can walk, shop, work, and play locally. And, and that's why uh, neighborhoods, the, the, the idea behind neighborhoods um, is, is to uh, permit uh, appropriate local serving um, services and amenities so that people can uh, really just get around and, and uh, walk rather than choose the automobile. Uh, and that they would have their amenities for day-to-day -day living close to home or close to where they work, uh, depending on uh, well, what it is they're, they're doing in neighborhoods. Um, and finally, I mentioned lower rise forms in neighborhoods. So the scale um, would be similar to what you see today, but uh, where we depart from the traditional um, approach to neighborhoods is that Brampton Plan permits greater heights within 400 meters of support transit corridors. And this is, um, of course, in support of um, you know, ensuring that we have people who are living um, and, and walking to transit, living close to transit and walking to transit. Next slide, please. So with respect to heights, Brampton Plan sets out a framework to guide uh, the type of built form envisioned in different areas in the city. And you heard me um, talk about the greatest and the tallest buildings being in urban centers and boulevards. And the idea is that there would be a transition 
from those areas to quarters, as I mentioned, which would be predominantly in a mid-rise form, um, uh, and and down to uh, neighborhoods, which is a lower scale form. And the rationale behind this, as I mentioned before, is that tall buildings would be directed to areas of the city that are well served by transit, um, and and that that transition would happen in a way that is respectful to existing uh, neighborhoods. And in that vein. Um, there's a, as I mentioned, there's a very robust urban design section of the plan, which also sets out um, policies to guide different forms of development, be they tall buildings, mid-rise buildings, and even low-rise buildings. Next slide, please. As we know, employment areas are places for job, and the plan protects for um, both traditional employment uses, as, such as industrial uh, manufacturing and office uses, but also promotes other uh, opportunities for uh, employment areas, such as innovation parks, logistics, um, as well as major institutional uses. So trying to attract those post-secondary institutions and hospitals where we can and where appropriate uh, the official plan protects for the long-term function of all employment areas and from further fragmentation. Uh, and in that regard, the plan includes policies related to employment lands conversion. It also includes policies with respect to land use compatibility um, between uh, the function, uh, the critical function uh, in employment areas and, um, and you know, appropriate separation distances and policies that are aligned with provincial guidelines um, to avoid negative impact on sensitive uses and also to protect uh, the destabilization of employment areas. Uh, and among a number of objectives for employment areas, the plan also sets out policies to improve the city's activity rate uh, to fo that it focuses on business retention and expansion and encourages investment and talent attraction. Um, where we, similar to neighborhoods, where we depart a little bit from the traditional approach with uh, employment areas in Brampton Plan, there is uh, additional uses that are contemplated within a land use designation on that other schedule I talked about, uh, and it's called the mixed use employment designation. And, and really the plan context for these areas is uh, accommodating a broad range of business, service, and institutional uses that would serve uh, the population. Uh, in the employment area, but also acts as a transition and a buffer from the sensitive uses in nearby residential areas. Next slide. The natural heritage, so we talked a lot about places where growth is anticipated, but we haven't talked yet about those places where growth is not anticipated at all and where we need to protect for the function of uh, those areas in the natural heritage system is definitely one of them. Um, and and as, as we probably know, uh, and I'm sure you, you've heard about the natural heritage system before, it includes a network of natural features such as wetlands, woodlands, valley lands, lakes and rivers, um, wetlands and ecological connections. And so the plan includes policies to protect for these features. Uh, for their ecosystems and habitats that uh, find their home in the natural heritage system. It sets the context for their preservation, their restoration, and long-term sustainability. And finally, the natural heritage system policies of the plan also support the city's objective for climate change adaptation. And I think that's it for me, and I, I will be handing it off to my colleague, Matt. Thanks so much, Andrea, and Andrew uh, as well. Uh, looking forward to walking through the, the building blocks that uh, Andrew introduced uh, at the beginning of the presentation. And really what the building blocks do is set the stage for organizing um, the wide range of city building policies uh, that build upon the land use and the city structure policies that Andrea worked through. So we're thinking about things like sustainability and climate change, housing, transportation, uh, parks and recreation, and economic development, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So when thinking about what some of these building blocks could be and what some of the priorities are uh, for these building blocks, we, we, we were informed by, by some of the feedback that we received uh, at the summer 2021 uh, town halls. Uh, and some of the things that we heard, um, you know, supporting a culture shift in transportation priorities, thinking about how we're integrating tall buildings into the city, how the city is managing infill development in neighborhoods, how the city can create better links between natural areas uh, and a concern that residents are spending a lot on housing and car ownership and so we heard a lot of common threads uh, between all of the engagement sessions uh, that, that you'll see uh, throughout the building blocks next slide please 
The first building block is the nurturing, strong, and connected communities building block. And within this building block, some of the key priorities are urban design and complete communities. In this uh, building block, we've applied five design lenses for the citywide urban design guidelines, which will be a key tool to realize uh, the policies and build upon the policies uh, of the official plan. Urban design policies have been created for different built forms, the public realm and streetscapes to achieve design excellence. Uh, and planning for community hubs and community service facilities has been thought through in this section uh, to really ensure that we're providing um, the amenities and services that are needed uh, to accommodate a growing community. Next slide, please. The next building block is the sustainability and climate change building block. And there's a number of key priorities in this building block being municipal leadership, building green communities, energy efficiency and emissions, building climate ready communities, green infrastructure and civic infrastructure. Um, and so some of the key policy themes here um, are, are to work towards reducing emissions uh, and other key city targets uh, that, that uh, the city has in place outside of Brampton plan. Some of the policy themes here that it supports the implementation of the Community Energy and Emissions Reduction Plan. Uh, it addresses cross-cutting sustainability policies. So thinking about uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, the corporation can do perhaps in, in, in addressing sustainability, but also thinking about things like neighborhood design, um, you know, uh, local efforts uh, and building uh, green and climate ready infrastructure. Uh, it sets the stage for Brampton uh, for current and future impacts of climate change provides direction for a climate adaptation plan, protects and enhances the urban forest, and considers the role of civic infrastructure, so thinking about things like water, wastewater, and stormwater, in building a climate-friendly community. Next slide, please. The next building block is housing and social matters. And so there's a number of targets set out in the housing Brampton plan, uh, sorry, rather, in housing Brampton, that Brampton plan works to, in, uh, to implement. Uh, some of the key priorities of this building block are housing, supply and diversity, uh, as well as transportation, affordability and food security. Uh, in addition to implementing the policies and recommendations of Housing Brampton, uh, this building block establishes a series of housing targets for both ownership and rental housing, and sets out policies to encourage missing middle housing forms and purpose-built market rentals. Uh, it permits single room occupancy housing, lodging housing and supportive housing, and supports additional residential units, family-friendly units, uh, and, and age-friendly and accessible housing. So uh, when we talk about all the different ways and, and locations that the city is growing, ensuring that all um, a wide range of housing types and tenures and forms uh, are provided uh, to meet the needs uh, of the community. This section also touches on, uh, as I mentioned, transportation, affordability, and food security, uh, which are really a part of building an affordable city. Next slide. The mobility and connectivity building block uh, looks at priorities around increasing connectivity, uh, sustainable mobility, and building and constructing complete streets. Some of the key themes of this section are providing a framework for the city's ongoing complete streets guide, uh, including the street context concept to recognize the link between place and mobility. So really trying to think about the types of places we want to build on certain streets um, versus the, solely the function of a street. Uh, this section sets up policies for active transportation, including micromobility, transit, streets, and goods movement. It implements and aligns with the city's parking plan to identify solutions to meet the city's future parking needs, addresses, addresses vision zero and equity in designing and building complete streets, uh, and really sets the stage for the city's future transportation master plan update. Next slide, please. The health and wellness building block um, covers key priorities around parks and open space and public health and well-being. Some of the key policy themes of this building block um, are a parks and open space hierarchy that's informed by uh, the city's parks and recreation master plan, uh, a framework for the design and acquisition of parklands, so ensuring that as growth is occurring, uh, that the city is able to secure this parkland through the development process. Uh, and protecting and minimizing the risk to health and safety by addressing things such as land use compatibility and noise and vibration. Next slide, please. The final building block uh, is the uh, jobs and living centers building block. And this touches on key priorities around economic development, arts, culture and tourism, and cultural heritage. And so the policies of this section uh, aim to foster local conditions where innovation and entrepreneurship can thrive, encourage remediation of brownfield and greyfield sites. So those are those sort of in, uh, underutilized sites within the urban area where there is an opportunity, uh, maybe for remediation and intensification or infill, 
and recognizes the important role of public art. It also sets up policies to identify, evaluate, and conserve Brampton's cultural heritage resources. Next slide, please. Thank you. The final slide that I'll speak to uh, relates to chapter three, the implementation and measurement chapter. Certainly an important chapter to help realize uh, the plan uh, and to implement it. Uh, implementing Brampton Plan is the job of the entire city, not just administration, council, or developers. And so the, the policies of this section set out how it'll be implemented and how the city, public, applicants, and agencies are to use the plan. It provides a framework for the completion of future secondary level plans, which is really important given the uh, more strategic approach to planning in Brampton plan that really looks towards secondary level plans being secondary plans, precinct plans, or major transit station area studies to provide that finer level detail uh, and, and greater context for the local conditions um, uh, of the different areas of the, of the city. It also uh, looks towards community improvement plans and other studies uh, to really help realize the policies of the plan. Importantly, uh, this section sets out the foundations for a growth management program to direct growth and in infrastructure. So when we talk about where growth is directed and where growth is intended to occur, it's equally as important um, to ensure that uh, the city is able to adequately serve those areas by things like water, wastewater and roads. And so the city will be working on developing this growth management program uh, informed by the Brampton plan and the policies of the section to ensure that coordination takes place. As Council is aware, uh, recent legislation over the number, past number of years has uh, provided direction to official plans to be updated. Uh, and so, uh, for example, most recently, Bill 13, uh, the Supporting People and Businesses Act, set out some changes um, uh, to the Planning Act that we've uh, worked to integrate into uh, this version of Brampton Plan to make sure we're update, reflecting the most recent legislation. And last, and certainly not least, uh, this section contains a glossary uh, where some key terms are defined to help support the interpretation of the plan. And with that, I will be passing the floor back to Andrea. Thank you, thank you so much, Matt and Andrea. Next, next slide, please. And you can actually go to the next slide. With, with respect to next steps, um, as, as everyone is aware, tonight is the statutory public meeting uh, to consider Brampton plan. Um, we are going to be doing, as we have done uh, throughout the process, a lot of listening. Um, we look forward to hearing what the public uh, has to say. Uh, there have already been uh, a number of pieces of correspondence received on the agenda tonight. Following June 3rd, which is the, the date that we have set uh, where we, uh, we need to set a, a deadline to stop uh, consultation so that we can actually uh, make any changes that are required to the plan. So after June 3rd, our team uh, will be huddling and updating, revising the plan uh, according to the feedback that we receive. And then we will bring the revised version forward on July 6th to Council. As I mentioned earlier in the evening, the plan that we bring forward on July 6th will include a comment matrix that records all of the comments that we've received as part of this process and how we have responded to all of those comments, including a track change version uh, in addition to a clean version of, of the final plan so that people can see how their comments were incorporated into the final version of Brampton plan that will be in front of council for consideration. As I also mentioned earlier, the region's official plan is currently with the province for approval. We hope that turnaround will be fairly quick. Um, our plan will not be able to be approved until the region's plan comes into full force and effect because ours is required to conform the region. So the ultimate timing of how quickly that process occurs after July 6th uh, is, is to be determined, but we, we hope that it is, it is fairly quick. So with that, um, next slide please. That concludes our presentation and we would like to open the, the floor up to any uh, questions, comments that, that may uh, the council may have or that the public may have on, on the presentation or the, the content of Brampton plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to city clerk. Uh, do we have any delegations tonight? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we have, we had one registered delegate, uh, Gurpartap Singh Tour, um, who had registered to delegate and I don't see, uh, Gurpartap present. Uh, we also do have other, um, members of the public present in the chambers. I don't know if there's anybody that wishes to come forward to speak on this item? 
if you do wish to come forward, you can come to the microphone and sign in at the, the book, and you'll have up to five minutes to address committee. Okay? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, there's no one in the audience who's uh, indicated they wish to speak, and we also do have uh, five pieces of correspondence identified under item 6.1 in regards to comments on the new Brampton plan. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll go, I'll open it up to questions uh, from members of committee. Are there any questions uh, from members of committee? I see Mr. none. Chair, we do. Yes. Uh, I see Councillor Vasante on the board in chambers, followed by Councillor Bowman. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Vasante. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks to staff for uh, bringing this forward today. Um, just a couple of questions. In looking through the agenda material and uh, the various schedules that are provided within um, the plan of itself, particularly Schedule 1, uh, and I don't know if the clerk can uh, put that up on uh, the board, and it, it shows... Uh, This, through you, Mr. Chair, this is Appendix 1 to the report. Is that what you were referring to, Councillor? Uh, I see it here as Schedule 1. Schedule 1 to the plan? Yes, city structure. Uh, shows a whole city. Um, <clears throat> and it shows uh, employment areas highlighted in uh, light blue. And uh, I guess I would note that the majority of these uh, areas are uh, existing uh, or uh, almost fully developed. Uh, employment areas, with the exception, uh, I think, of uh, in the southwest and in the north uh, west corners of the city. And so I guess my question to staff would be, uh, given that the trend for the activity rates in the city of Brampton uh, over the past uh, 20 or so years has been trending lower, um, how can we uh, reverse that like if we follow through on Brampton plan as it is indicated here, will we be able to uh, get that activity rate to a much higher number? Understanding, of course, that uh, with mixed use, there certainly comes a lot of opportunity uh, for job creation within uh, already uh, built up areas, or for example, when there's redevelopment opportunities that arise. Um, but has this, have, have, as we create this plan, have we taken into account the numbers that we want to achieve and how will, will we be able to get there? Yes, I, I, absolutely. Thank you. And then through the chair. That's an excellent question and something that uh, was very important to us as we were creating Brampton Plan. Uh, I'll start off and if uh, Andrea or Matt have anything to add, please do follow me. Um, the core of the employment areas that, that currently exist, I think Brampton uh, is in a very strong position. It has a strong employment base, a very strong logistics sector, et cetera. Um, we want to ensure that we protect and enhance the current base that we have, but we also want to diversify o over time over the next three decades. And as you mentioned, Councillor Vicente, the, the key to that diversification is really um, embarking in a, a new direction. And the 2040 vision really unlocked the key to that. And that's building um, better place quality and urban place. Um, it's well known across North America and around the world that if you want to attract the best, the brightest, um, different types of jobs, creative industry, um, uh, sophisticated tech, et cetera, you have to create the types of places that those people want to live in. Um, and it starts with place quality. Uh, it starts with an urban place that's transit focused. Uh, a lot of folk, young folks growing up today, they, they don't want to live in places where you have to drive everywhere. So focusing on compact, mixed use places around higher order transit is key to um, growing the employment sector in Brampton moving forward. Again, we're not ignoring what's there today. We want to build on and enhance the, the, the base in Brampton. But I think that move is critically important. And uh, as we mentioned in the city structure, that CN rail corridor is very important strategically to growing the employment base um, over in the city moving forward. And that area directly connects downtown Mount Pleasant, Heritage Heights, and Bramgo um, to 
the Knowledge and Innovation um, Center in Kitchener-Waterloo, downtown Toronto. And I think what you'll find uh, over the next few decades, and we're starting to see that with some of the large employers in the city of Brampton, is moving away, um, and not all of them, but some of them, will want to move away from um, conventional drive to satellite areas and being located directly on transit so that employees can shuttle back potentially between um, branches of office offices or for employers to move between those centers along that rail corridor. So uh, to summarize, I think it's about uh, building urban places where um, young, cool people want to live. That's really important, keeping your young folks in your community, attracting the best and the brightest, uh, creating the type of environment that supports entrepreneurialism, um, and allowing uh, <clears throat> businesses to, th to thrive, but also focusing on transit, walkability, et cetera. And if there's anything we learned uh, through the pandemic, it's those types of places uh, are the ones that, that fared the best. Um, being able to meet outdoors uh, on sidewalk cafes and conduct business outside, uh, that's part of, of building up our resilience over time. So ho hopefully that, that uh, answers your question. Yeah, I, and I agree with you 100% in terms of uh, the urban opportunities that exist for job creation. But uh, I think what, uh, what I'm looking for uh, what we have been looking for is if our activity rate today hovers around 30% and some of the better cities that we compete with, uh, their activity rate is double that or higher. And so understanding as you look at this schedule, just a, as, as an at-a-glance view of the city of Brampton, if these areas highlighted in blue, the majority of which already exist today, uh, and understanding that as urban growth continues to happen throughout the city of Brampton, there will be opportunities at ground level for uh, more employment. There may be opportunities for office, et cetera. Uh, but if these blue areas represent what is today, the majority of the 30% activity rate uh, for the city of Brampton, are we not going to uh, miss by a wide margin uh, getting to an activity rate of let's say you know, 50% for the city of Brampton. Uh, like, are, are we setting aside enough land here and, and enough opportunities uh, just within those urban areas that we see will be happening in the future? Is that going to be enough for us to increase our activity rates substantially to where we want it to be? Yeah, that's it. thank you. And, and, and through the chair, uh, absolutely. The um, the urban cores, the urban centers, the transit spines here, Ontario Queen Street, as well as the town centers, Bram West, Heritage Heights, etc. There's a tremendous amount of land within those areas and ability to absorb jobs. Uh, and we're talking about a different type of job. So the the land intensive warehousing, et cetera, those, those would go in the blue areas. Um, and I think over time, you'll see those areas start to intensify. But what we're talking about are more knowledge-based jobs, uh, that could be office jobs, uh, creative economy, et cetera. Those would be directed to the mixed-use places, the transit supportive areas. And uh, there's absolutely a tremendous amount of ability to absorb those jobs. So. Uh, we're not concerned at all about having the, the available land or ability to, to accommodate those jobs. The key is we're competing with every other city in southern Ontario to attract um, that type of job. Um, and it's really ensuring that we put our best foot forward and create the urban type of environment where the employees that work in those sectors, they want to come and live in Brampton because it's such a great place. And that's how you tip the scale uh, in, in favor of Brampton. So through you, Chair, uh, my next question would have to do with uh, transportation and uh, logistics. Uh, that is considered to be uh, one of the single largest components for job growth potential in the future. Um, how does that align with what we have here in Brampton plan? Are we accommodating for that? Or is that intended to uh, be accommodated within the areas that are highlighted, for example, on this map? Yeah, so through the chair, the, the uh, 
a lot of the core, uh, the, the employment-based transportation logis logistics, we would see those uh, maintaining in the blue area. Um, it's probably not uh, the best idea to see logistics spread right across the city. Um, as, as we all know, that brings a lot of heavy, noisy truck traffic. So you really want to keep that confined to certain areas of your city, certain corridors that can be truck priority routes. Uh, because you want to maintain other areas of the city to be cool urban places. So um, if you have logistics everywhere, um, it will actually tend to adversely impact your city. Uh, we recognize the importance of logistics. It's incredibly important to current Brampton and future Brampton, but it is important to have it uh, direct to certain areas. And we do see that uh, maintaining uh, within the, the blue areas on this drawing. Okay, and my last question, Mr. Chair, would have to do with, uh, in terms of our economic development team, um, have we um, consulted with economic development in, in terms of uh, the final recommendations and Brampton plan all in of itself? Uh, has there been a lot of uh, dialogue between planning and economic development? It's through you, Chair. Um, yes, there has. And, and I probably ventured a little too far into the economic development territory this night. Uh, tonight, I'm sure uh, Claire Barnett would, would want to add uh, a few comments. But uh, we had an extensive staff working team uh, right across the corporation that helped create Draft Brampton Plan. And that included um, multiple working sessions with our economic development group. Um, they reviewed um, most of the key sections that are, are relevant to economic development. So they have been engaged in the process. They continue to be engaged in the process. And any changes that are made after uh, this evening uh, and after June 3rd, we will absolutely be vetting those through our economic development group. Thank you. And if, uh, as uh, Vice Chair of ECDEV, I'd like to see uh, more of that happening, particularly as we begin to... Uh, pin down all of these different aspects. It's important, I think, to all of us on council to know that uh, it has that stamp of approval from MECDEV as well. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, if members of committee will permit the fact that uh, I think we have a person now in chambers who would like to speak on the Brampton plan. So I will extend uh, that courtesy first to a member of the public and I'll hand it over to the city clerk uh, to go to uh, delegate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we do have a person that wishes to speak. If you can just state your name for the record, and then you have up to five minutes to address the committee. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Anil Sadev. Uh, so I'm a resident of Brampton. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for hosting this meeting and having an open discussion. My question is in regards to Toronto Gore Density Policy Review Study that was conducted, and we received an email for it. Uh, it's going to be specifically under point number three, where it talks about considering site-specific amendments to the official plan zoning bylaw to permit complementary uses, such as commercial, institutional, and offices, and residential uses and density beyond those noted above as state residential lots that have frontage on Gorewood Drive, Countryside, Mayfield, and the Go Road. What I needed a little more clarification on this point, what does that entail for us? Because our property does have frontage on these roads as listed. And how does it impact our property moving forward? Is this a plan of Brampton plan like we're talking about today? And does it, does it belong in the same timeline? That. Would, would you like me to respond, to Chair? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and thank, thank you so much for, for the question. And, and what I would, would absolutely offer, um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, we, we'd be happy to sit down with you and uh, look at your site in detail and explain uh, the implications of, of Brampton Plan. Um, and uh, we can have the folks that were involved in the Toronto Gore study in attendance as well. Um, we did uh, consult with them uh, very actively when we were developing Brampton Plan to ensure that the results that came out of that Toronto Gore study were incorporated. Um, we've included that in the special site, special section, special policy area of Brampton Plan. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do is respect, be respectful uh, of the wishes of, of that community. So 
Um, I, it, it might be most prudent if we were to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and uh, and we can share details with you. Again, I'm, I'm not sure exactly which property uh, your, your own, you own, but we'd be happy to, to meet with you uh, and, and walk you through that if that's helpful. Okay. I think we may have another question. Just give me one second. Okay, so uh, I have my family here, and we have another family friend here as well. Uh, our property have frontage on both Countryside and Gorbet Drive, and uh, the other, another property has frontage on just Gorbet Drive. Um, is it still, I guess, better to meet you in person to discuss this? It, 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 it might be a little easier, um, and then we, we could roll up our sleeves and, and give it a, a, an appropriate amount of time to to really understand um, what what your concerns are, or if you're looking for a little bit of guidance. I, I'm not sure uh, if you're looking about the potential development, or uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what what you're looking to understand. So yeah, we're just because because we know we are guess focusing more on urban development, and you guys looking to change the zoning okay. for these. Uh, estate lots to smaller lots, perhaps having it commercial or perhaps building in like more high density uh, residential pockets, right? Okay. Um, so we just wanted to know um, how does the zoning impact for these specific lots, right? We can meet with you in person. We're more than uh, happy to do that. If that's better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 think that, that, I think that might be helpful, and, and we're, we're happy to take as much time as required to, to walk you through and provide you a bit of guidance. Okay, we'll be in touch with you later then. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go now back to the speakers list and Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I'd just like to follow up on what Councillor Vicente had uh, mentioned as well. If we could bring up that same... Um, uh, diagram with all the blue areas um, and Andrew one thing that, that really concerns me um, is the fact that you know you mentioned that the blue areas are still going to be those areas where we maintain the warehousing the logistics things of that nature but the majority of that blue is right in our transportation corridor between Steeles and uh, Queen Street so I'm a little concerned that, uh, you know, with all the growth and development that we're going to have with higher order transit going on those corridors, that we're still going to be able to maintain all the trucking lanes that currently exist in that area. Yes, uh, that, through, through the chair. That, again, excellent question. And um, there will be some tension um, moving forward. As Brampton urbanizes more uh, from, from where it is today, and specifically the, the corridor steels, uh, which uh, it is in early stages of uh, exploring higher order transit potential. Uh, Queen Street is well on its way. Uh, we've already had some of the major transit station areas identified uh, as part of the region's uh, official plan. Um, the Brampton plan, what it does is it sets up the ability to review particularly um, delineated station areas around major transit station areas along corridors such as Queen uh, and Steeles. Um, and the purpose of, of, of doing that is that each of these station areas will be studied in detail. Um, all of the relevant uh, folks, the landowners, et cetera, will be part of the process to understand what's appropriate uh, and how does higher order transit impact land uses and particularly those employment areas. A number of those are provincially significant employment zones. Uh, so we need to ensure the integrity of those areas, but there also is provincial legislation that allows some sensitive uses to creep in to those employment areas within MTSA. So um, that's part of the process that will unfold from here on in. Um, and again, the, the stage was set for that with the approval of the region's official plan. Um, and again, I, I, there's no magic answer to, to give you this evening other than each one of those areas will be study, studied in detail to determine what are appropriate land uses, how higher order transit can work with land uses to create uh, a vibrant uh, urban city. And you're absolutely right. Uh, balancing the competing interests of large trucks 
with a more urban place um, is one of the things that we've identified as being a challenge for Brampton moving forward, particularly along a corridor like Steeles. Um, and it, if you think about 400 series highways, they were originally designed to carry trucks uh, for goods movement. So we need to be very careful and thoughtful moving forward about where we direct trucks to the, the corridors that we identify as truck routes uh, and how we balance the competing objectives. We've all seen the beautiful images of Queen Street uh, with walking, cycling, bike lanes, higher order transit. Um, so there will be some tension that we're going to have to work through uh, in collaboration with Council and all the relevant stakeholders over the coming years. And, and some of it are going to be some challenging issues that we're going to need to address. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does, Andrew. And I just wanted everybody to be aware that there's going to be issues. There's going to be a lot of issues because as much as we love to say that everybody's going to get out of their cars and take transit, um, the shift is also on from gas cars to electric cars. So, you know, there's going to be just as many electric cars as there are fighting for spaces on the road with transit and trucking in these corridors. So I think we need to be very careful about that. Um, we talk about higher density um, in, in terms of building and population, areas of high density corridors, um, but I, I don't hear us talking about high density employment. Um, what is our plan to get much, much higher density employment, much like, for instance, the financial district in Toronto? What's our plan to, to get something like that? Yeah, and I, I, I would uh, wel welcome Claire Barnett joining us because I, I'm sure she could talk more intelligently than I can about, about this specifically. But um, in, in principle, I, I think uh, if you're thinking about uh, a CBD, higher density employment areas, the, the intention would be absolutely to try and direct a lot of that type of employment uh, to some of the urban centers uh, and where we have higher order transit, CN Rail, BRT, LRT. Those are the natural places where I think that type of high density employment would want to gravitate towards. Um, there is certainly absolutely um, opportunity to intensify a lot of our existing employment areas, but in terms of a, a more traditional CBD, um, that's probably more appropriate in downtown, uptown, um, stretching along here, Ontario, stretching along Queen Street corridor. So I think that that red zone that you see on this map is where we would want to direct a lot of that intensity towards. Okay, and, and final question for you, Andrew, and you know I, I uh, harp on this quite a bit in, in all our meetings that we have. How are we defining a neighborhood? You know, in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, neighborhoods were single family dwellings um, with, with amenities close, with small recreation facilities close, uh, schools close. We've gone away from that now to mega centers um, uh, like Cassie Campbell and, and Gore Meadows. So we're not creating those neighborhood gatherings anymore. And in my mind, um, the, the way we are headed right now with the Ontario Bill 108, second units, garden suites, I, I see at some point the elimination for the most part of, of a lot of the older single family dwelling neighborhoods. Um, how do we compensate for that? Um, excellent question and, and through the chair. Um, to start off, I, I think a, a neighborhood at its most simplest level is uh, draw a circle 15 minutes uh, in, in every direction from, from where one may live. And the goal is to try and create an opportunity for complete living within that, that radius. Um, neighborhoods across the city, they're all going to be a little bit different. Um, there can be low density neighborhoods, single family homes, uh, you know, smaller neighborhood parks, et cetera. There can be very high density urban neighborhoods where you've got rapid transit um, and everything is much more vertically integrated. So 
every neighborhood in Brampton, um, they're all going to be a little bit different, all a little unique, and that's actually a good thing. Um, each town center in Brampton 30 years from now, they shouldn't all be the same. They should all have their own distinct character, etc. Same with the urban centers. You want them to be a little different. Downtown uh, should be the biggest and the best with the performance theaters, the center of cultural activity, etc. So at its highest level, each neighborhood is going to be a little different, a little unique. Um, but the intent is that within a 15-minute walk, we want to try and get as close to possible being complete living. Now, is that achievable everywhere? It, it's going to be challenging in certain areas, no question. Uh, but it's certainly a, a noble goal to pursue. Um, Brampton has a significant amount of uh, low-density single-family homes already within its housing stock. Um, there are certainly going to be more that come. Um, I, I think the, the goal of, of Brampton Plan is really to create a diversity of housing options. And uh, if we look to our neighbors to the south, um, what you see in cities like Mississauga um, is a lot of small, low density, and then a lot of tall, and not a lot in the middle. Um, and I think what Brampton Plan is trying to do is create a good cross-section of housing typologies, ranging from singles right up to high-density vertical living. Uh, and that's to provide opportunities for living throughout all stages of life because your needs change. Uh, when you have young children, uh, school-aged children, maybe you want the single-family home on a cul-de-sac. As you get a little older, maybe you want to downsize into a townhouse or a condo, etc. So I think we're, we're trying to be respectful of the needs that serve the population throughout all stages of life. Um, and single-family single homes are not going away, uh, but in order to accommodate three to 400,000 new population, there is a need to look at a diversity of housing options, which include higher density forms, um, single semis, towns, multis, triplexes, fourplexes, uh, right up into mid-rise and, and tall buildings. So um, I, I hope that answers the question. It, it, it's really, we want to create a, a lot of options and a diversity of housing typologies. Okay, and, and thank you, Andrew. That's the, that's the answer I was actually hoping for, um, because any of the residents who are tuning in and listening to this or anybody who reads the Brampton plan needs to be aware that uh, in, in neighborhoods where there is infill developments, you're going, you're going to see exactly what you just said. You're going to see a, a wide variety of housing introduced into neighborhoods where that specific type of housing hadn't been before. Yeah, no, I, I should add... Um it's respectful intensification. Um, a, a lot of folks refer to it as gentle intensification. Um, a lot of what you see on this drawing, uh, the yellow area on this drawing, uh, which are conventionally singles, lower density housing forms, uh, we wouldn't envision 12, 15, 20 story towers dropping in the middle of that type of context. So we would envision, even if you have gentle intensification, uh, it should respect the character and, and form of existing communities where we anticipate a lot of the, the density um, and the, the different housing typologies, the higher density housing typologies, is really the areas that can absorb it, the areas around transit, town centers, urban centers. So I, I don't want to scare people that are, are living in um, you know, stable, single-family communities that all of a sudden they're going to get a lot of intensification. That's not the intention here. The intention is to direct that intensification to certain areas and respect the integrity of existing communities. Okay, and my, and my last question, sorry, I didn't mean to, to drag this out, Andrew. You mentioned um, greenhouse gases trying to control uh, one of the top producers of greenhouse gases, automobiles. Um, we also need to be very, very aware that another top uh, contributor to greenhouse gas is concrete. So, you know, we're, we're saying on one hand, we're going to try and control greenhouse gases with fewer automobiles, but we're going to put all sorts of concrete buildings. Um, what does the Brampton plan say 
in terms of new building and new building um, materials. Anything? Does it does it specifically get into that? Yeah, I mean, Brampton Plan is a higher level document. It certainly encourages innovation in building typologies. Um, the Brampton Plan will work as a companion document to things like urban design guidelines that where we would envision um, getting into sustainable um, forms of, of development, such as mass timber buildings. Uh, I know Madam E is currently interested in, in a mass timber building up in, in the northwest area of Brampton. So we do envision um, that, uh, that that type of building um, components, technologies will, will enhance over time because you're absolutely right. Um, we, we need to be um, thinking about everything that we're doing, the way we're building, the way we're behaving, and its impact on, on climate change. So we've certainly created the policy regime to enable that type of thing to happen, uh, but there's more detail that would be required in working with our, our building department, et cetera, to make sure that uh, new technology uh, is enabled uh, as we move forward over the next few decades. Okay, thanks very much. That's, that's all my questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Singh. I just want to talk, touch on some of the issues that uh, Councillor Bowman actually brought up. Um, you know, I, I've also brought up many times when we look at... Uh, Sorry, we can't, I can't, we can't hear Councillor Singh. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Hello? Yeah. So when we look at uh, concrete and, and road expansions and whatnot, um, that is a big greenhouse emitter. And I know this plan isn't going into as much detail, but I do have a, one other question. When we look at our <clears throat> inventory of homes and certain homes getting um, old or near the end of their life cycle, I think of, for example, uh, the Toronto Gore area, my area, and a lot of people are rebuilding those homes. Do we look at uh, rejuvenation of older communities and how that might look as well as some of their uh, inventory of homes ages and and um, what that rejuvenation might also look like? Yeah, again, we, we, we talk about uh, how to approach um, re rejuvenation, gentrification, whatever term you want to apply to, to some older neighborhoods. Um, I, I think the key is maintaining character, um, scale. Um, th those are really important. And, and this is not new to Brampton. Uh, virtually every city in North America faces these challenges about how, how you reinvent uh, neighborhoods with new housing stock that doesn't undermine the integrity of those communities. So we certainly have policies that talk about how to do this appropriately, contextually appropriately. But again, um, other companion documents, such as urban design guidelines, will, will provide a lot of the detail about how you do that, how, how you build new buildings that fit in with their community, with the character, uh, and don't, really don't undermine the character of, of those communities. Uh, does that help? Um, yeah, I, I guess it does. I mean, I, I wasn't looking toward, the, you know, the character is going to change when you tear down a house that's eight years old and build a new one. Right. So, uh, you know, what that would look like and, and what the guidelines are around that. And, and it's inevitable. It's already happening in my area. I can only imagine it helping it uh, uh, happening in other areas. So, yeah, I'd be interested to see because I see it just increasing. We're seeing it in Mississauga. We're seeing it in Malton, for example. You know, um, it, we're seeing it in Etobicoke. Uh, that's another um, area where I know people are um, uh, tearing down and rebuilding. And it's just inevitable that it's going to come to Brampton. So, yeah, I'd be very interested to see what that specifically would look like. You know, are we going to make sure that the new developments are much more environmentally sustainable, uh, you know, what, what would sort of be the guiding policies around that? Uh, you know, the character, you, you will preserve it to a degree, but to a degree you won't. It'll be a new a new, a new uh, house or, or, or a new uh, uh, dwelling. So um, it, it's going to be a challenge for sure. Absolutely. And, and the one thing I would add, just uh, the, the improvements in the building code, um, a, a lot of the houses that you're, you're, you're probably referring to were likely built in the, the 40s, the 50s, 60s. The building code has changed dramatically since that. So even if you just build basic buildings that meet today's building code, 
their environmental footprint are, are so much better than, than previous buildings. Their, their windows are more sustainable, et cetera. So um, a lot of that comes just from base building code, but uh, Brampton has the ability, the tools um, to guide uh, and control to some extreme uh, what, what, what that infill looks like uh, and, and guide what we're, we're trying to achieve in those communities. So we have a number of tools at our, dispo at our disposal. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Plushy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, um, my kudos to staff, the amount of work that they that they've put into to this plan. Um, I know that it's been a it's been a long road, and I think you um, you have all done a fantastic job. Um, a couple of things that I <clears throat> wanted to to talk about, and I really have to get into the plan in a greater level of detail. It is a it's quite a good read. Once you uh, once you dive into it, but um, a lot of the things in here that are related to um, like downtowns, uptowns, Bramleys, Bram West, Mount Pleasants, uh, even Trinity Commons, Heritage Heights, um, I'm looking for something that's a little bit more ward specific, and how the wards integrate not only with the other wards but Brampton as a whole. And I'm glad you used the phrase. And I forget the phrase now that you used, Andrew. It was um, like a like a gentle intensification, um, which which I appreciated. But what does that mean for areas like you know Heart Lake, Snellgrove, um, you know Peel Village? Peel Village is is somewhat of the no because you we know what's happening at Trevor's World and downtown, the proximity to it. But um, without the infrastructure that is. Um, that is not set up now in some of those areas when we talk about intensification or those holdouts um, <clears throat> and people wanting to put or developers wanting to put you know 30 units in in half an acre um, but not being able to provide any type of uh, transportation or uh, or walking we have you know tons of great trails a trail system in Brampton um, but for them to be able to not uh, be so dependent <clears throat> when they move into the neighborhood, right on a right with a, a vehicle driving to you know the local grocery store or or plaza um, in some of those older communities, um, and just to further that a little bit is what I don't see in the plan is you know the plan is a lot about growth, you know nine hundred eighty five thousand to twenty fifty one is a big number. <clears throat> But how does the plan talk about uh, supporting the existing communities um, that are um, that are you know the older older they're not even that old now but they're but they will be come 2051. Um, where's the support and how do we support those communities? Excellent question to, through the chair. I'll, I'll start and then uh, Andrew and Matt, if you want to add anything, please please feel free to do so. Um, I think part of the, the art of, of, of Brampton Plan and uh, dealing with tremendous growth over the next three decades, and Brampton is going to remain one of the fastest growing cities in the country, is preserving those special places, Councillor, that you just identified, Heart Lake, Peel Village, etc. Um, a lot of people love uh, and cherish living in those communities. So we want to make sure that they continue to be great places to live. And the reality is, the way Brampton has grown, there will be areas that um, are a little more car-oriented than others. And, and I think what Brampton Plan articulates is uh, the ability to deliver options and choices for people. So, as I mentioned earlier, at, at a certain stage in your life, um, it's perfectly appropriate. Um, there's nothing wrong with living in on a cul-de-sac in, in Heart Lake or Peel Village, it's okay. But for those that want to experience urban living, um, that want to potentially not have or, or can't drive, um, maybe they want to live in an urban place where they can access higher order transit. So it's about providing options for our residents and uh, our employees. And uh, there's a lot of existing neighborhoods where it's... Um, I don't want to call protect because I, I don't think that's the right word, but I think enhance, ensure they age well. Um, we, as council is familiar with the nurturing neighborhoods community, 
going out, undertaking audits, working with neighborhoods over time to understand are there gaps in your communities? Um, can we add some parks? Are there some amenities that you're missing? Um, so enabling that type of thing to occur to make those areas as complete as possible. But the reality is uh, a community in Heart Lake is going to look very different from a neighborhood in Uptown. Um, they're just different contexts, different types of places. And that's okay. It's perfectly appropriate. Andrew, is there anything that, that you wanted to add to that? I, I was just going to build on your comment, Andrew, in terms of community services and facilities in existing areas and new areas. And there's a um, quite a number of policies in the plan that speak to things like uh, ensuring that soft services as well as hot, uh, hard services and infrastructure keeps pace with uh, development and certainly with infill growth, there's an opportunity to um, take a look at those existing rec centers, libraries, daycares, uh, parks, and, and make sure that it, we're not just uh, providing services for new residents, but also taking care of existing residents too and ensuring that we're not um, putting undue strain on, on those services and, and facilities um, and looking at social services too. Um, and, and I'd also add that um, uh, in the plan, there are policies with respect to um, uh, building on things like schools uh, in existing neighborhoods. As communities evolve, there's opportunities to, to look at those focal points, to maybe co-locate other services in those existing communities because they do evolve over time and uh, the population, as they age, they have different needs. So uh, lots of great policies. I think I heard someone mention it was a good read, and I'm happy to hear that. Uh, so word search find for community hubs, and there's lots of lots of great stuff there. And, and that's great, and I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I love the fact that, you know, nurturing neighborhoods is going to continue to grow and thrive. Um, and nurturing neighborhoods is a great tool for for residents to be able to get out into the community, not only meet people but talk to talk to staff and and provide their their input. What I find in participating in some of those walks, though, nurturing neighborhoods, unfortunately, and it's the way it's it's kind of set up because it has to be. It's reactive. It's it's neighborhoods going out, communities going out, and saying, you know, we don't feel we're we're serviced here properly with with the park that we have. Uh, you know, the community has been growing, or this community's been declining. We need more of like a top park get, something like that. And it's very reactive and not that much proactive. And it's next to impossible to go out and with planning staff and and to talk to, talk to these people about Brampton plan. I, I think that you know, with the lack of delegates that we've he had here today, tells you that you know, yeah, it is a good read, and it's complicated for a lot of people. But the support that I'm looking for in the communities, and you mentioned Heart Lake for one. So Heart Lake is is a community that um, is it, it still has the cars for you know you're you're going outside of of Heart Lake and your main intersection of Sandalwood and Kennedy, but a lot of people walk. A lot of people walk to the Heart Lake uh, Town Center. Um, a lot of people walk to Loafers Lake, Jim Arch Deacon, and and the trail systems with the Etobicoke Creek Trail. But what you, what I find now, and it's 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 more and more almost daily, is the traffic jam that's happening on Sandalwood, and it's almost causing a divide with North and South. The people from the South don't really tra walk anymore uh, to the North, and the people from the North aren't walking uh, South anymore unless they're using you know the trail system. It's it's and it, that's how I'm that's what I'm referring to when I'm. When I'm talking about you know the plan and how it affects those existing communities, with all of the you know we still don't have two way all day go, um, we still don't have Zoom past Mayfield Road, you know there's so many we still don't have, and what I'd like to see in a plan is areas that are specific to uh, communities, established communities, what the infrastructure, um, when it's going to get there what it means for the current residents and the future residents to come um, with with infills. And I've always said, you could ask any delegate that has ever come to the city of Brampton on an infill, you could, you could tell them what exactly this means for all future infills, and I think they'd all be here to, uh, to delegate. And uh, just with respect to, you know, the walking distance to grocery stores, the lack of transit in areas that 
you know, there's there's still these four holdout lots that are, you know, being picked off one by one as as one owner getting ready to put in, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 units and what it means to those areas. Yeah, what, what I, could, I could add, um, Brampton Plan is really intended to be somewhat high level direction setting but I, I think a number of the issues you're identifying, they're, they're micro neighborhood issues, in, in, incredibly important. Um, what Brampton Plan intends to do, and there's a lot of secondary plans um, a, across the city of Brampton. Some of them guided initial development of communities. Some of them probably aren't overly relevant anymore if a community <laughs> is already built out. Um, it may be an appropriate time. Time. Yeah, it, it may be an appropriate time to go in and, and take a new fresh eyes approach to some of these areas and conduct a new precinct plan uh, and say, okay, we've got this existing community. These are some of the new challenges we're facing. This area is growing, evolving. It looks different than when it was first built. So what are strategically the things that we need to do here? And I think that is actually going to be commonplace. It's quite normal for a city to, to do that. Um, a secondary plan that guided initial development will look different from a new precinct plan done 30 years later because the city has grown and evolved. So I, I, I would suggest maybe that it, it might be in order to, to take a look at some of those areas and, and conduct uh, more micro details um, to, to help guide. I hope that helps. No, it does for sure, Andrew. And I just have to say, you know, I think it was last term at the beginning of this term when we were talking about you know, revamping and relooking at all of those older secondary plans. You know, we have secondary plans. I, I couldn't even guess what the oldest one that's currently uh, relevant in the city of Brampton, but I know of one that's 50 years old. So, you know, something that, <clears throat> things that need to be touched up like that. And, and I think that's kind of that next step where something that, you know, next term of council needs to really put their mind forward to, to look at, you know all these existing communities, the support services behind them, the future of what those what those communities are intended to to look like, and and more uh, you know ward specific, so that you know counselors and staff can get out to the communities to to really put this in front of them and get the feedback from the residents. Thank you very much for your um, again for for thank you to staff for all this work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to staff for uh, the presentation and all their hard work. Um, you had mentioned um, Mississauga is, uh, you know, uh, low intensity and then they have, um, you know, high rises and there's not much in between. And that we are uh, looking to kind of fill that uh, gap, same gap, uh, in between gap that uh, Mississauga is missing. I was wondering, can you give an example of uh, somewhere or some city that's where it's worked uh, and that we can kind of aspire to, to, to be like? Uh, through the chair, you're, you're putting me on the spot to pick a, <laughs> a great city in the world. I, there's probably a, a number that would come to mind. Um, usually, what again, this is my personal opinion of, of great cities. They tend to be mid-rise in scale, um, places like Boston, uh, a lot of European cities, um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Vancouver, Toronto tend to be um, really tall towers, but where you get the greatest, um, most vibrant places and, uh, and the best mix of housing typologies tends to be mid-rise places. Um, you know, Washington has a height limit, I think it's 10 stories. Um, very transit focused, great transit system. So um, I, I think that's something that we need to pay attention to um, and not just move from low density single homes to big, tall, shiny towers because uh, it's really that middle housing typology where you can get better affordable options um, and it really ends up delivering a more vibrant city um, because the buildings tend to relate more to the street a uh, lot of studies done, um, once you get above six stories in building heights, people tend to engage in the urban environment less uh, because they go from a, a parking garage up to their condo unit um, and they're, they're in and out of their unit, in and out of their car. 
whereas six stories and less, people tend to walk more and engage in the public realm. So in any city, uh, there, there's dozens you could point to around the world that tend to be mid-rise in scale, um, are, are probably good models to look at. But again, I, I think the, the magic here is to provide options. Um, and it, it ranges the continuum from singles right up to tall buildings. And I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I just, from experience, I've lived in a, uh, a tall building way up high, and it was almost uh, a quest just to get uh, uh, downstairs. And so I think, you know, with more mid-rises like D.C., you know, I go there quite often. I think they're doing a wonderful job there. Um, and there's a ton of gentrification going on. So I don't know if, if it's to, to look, uh, you look at it bad or good, but... Uh, um, you know, I've seen some of the changes that they that they have made, and you know, I think it really boils down to a couple of things. And one is people are social uh, creatures, and uh, the way we would design our neighborhoods and cities that uh, you know we need to ensure that people are congregating and uh, gathering together. You know, whatever country, state, city I've been in, I, that's the one thing I've noticed is that people want to get together. And I think I mentioned it uh, just a, a last meeting. Simple changes we've made to the park have, you know, brought so many more uh, people uh, to it. And so you put, you know, small little soccer net, or you uh, you improve some of the, uh, the the sports fields or courts, and a lot more people are coming. And uh, um, and again, I think uh, the second part is accessibility. Uh, just being able to walk uh, instead of getting on your uh, getting in your car uh, to go do groceries or go get some shopping done. I think. Uh, uh, those are two things that uh, are, are really key, and uh, you know, I just uh, want to thank you guys once again for uh, all the all the hard work you guys have done. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I don't see any further speakers, so um, I will move that the chair be heard. And I thank you, uh, echoing a lot of comments from my uh, colleagues. I think there were some uh, excellent points uh, regarding uh, uh, protecting the employment and. Um, you know, it's interesting conversation about uh, um, the whole uh, argument regarding density. Uh, it was interesting, and I know you're working very closely with the region. Uh, last week, uh, there was a lot of discussion around um, all the empty bedrooms in the city of Brampton. So the idea that, um, you know, one of the challenges, you have the biggest uh, cohort from a demographic basis, which are the baby boomers who are retiring. Uh, many of them are single you know, they, they own a home and they're the sole, per, the sole uh, uh, resident there. Uh, however, there's not options for them to sort of uh, uh, scale down. So, uh, you know, the options that are available on the market are your sort of uh, townhouses, which are not sort of uh, senior friendly uh, from that perspective. And so it was interesting that the inventory and there's going to be more work uh, there uh, and, um, you know, in, in, in conjunction with what we're doing, uh, because I, I do see that there's a lot of opportunity there um, to uh, um, for us to try to have uh, more options when it comes to, um, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, some of these uh, single family uh, dwellings being used as multi-purpose or uh, multi uh, um, multi-use, uh, um, uh, similar to what they have in Montreal, because I was uh, amazed to see, um, you know, a lot of family that, that I have in Montreal where, you know, one home has, you know, three or four apartments uh, in, a, in a single dwelling. So uh, I think coupled with this work and what's happening at the region, uh, some really sort of interesting, but, you know, the, the only sort of question I would would leave it here and, and you know the struggle that we have and it was you know it's great to listen to your comments about that sort of uh, mid high rise uh, but when when you're in a city like what I guess the crisis that we're we're facing with the, the rapid population growth and we do see you know based on the last census that uh, there's been a little bit of a, a slowdown but based on our numbers um, just for us to afford the public services uh, and to deal with um, you know, uh, how do we support a, a transit system? So we're, we're told by, you know, all the specialists that density is critical to us, you know, urbanizing and, and, and us becoming a big city. Yet at the same time, we're dealing with all these growing pains. Uh, and I did like that comment that you provided about sort of that sort of uh, mid high rise. So how do we, how do we get it where, 
Um, there's transition opportunities uh, that some of these infills can transition and we don't have, you know, some of the situations you talked about single dwellings into, you know, uh, high rise. I, I still believe we need to build a density along those major corridors. But the mid rise is something that you don't see many investors uh, uh, coming to the city for. So, uh, you know, does this plan incentivize or provide opportunity uh, for some of that mid rise that you talked about? Yeah, th thank you so much, Chair. Um, it absolutely um, talks about mid-rise as being a, a desirable built form. Um, the Brampton plan does not uh, offer incentives. Obviously, those that would be uh, other programs that, that could come to, to bear. But um, I absolutely agree 100% uh, 100 that uh, there's numerous ways to bring density to a city. And we, we mentioned Washington just for no other reason than it came to mind. Um, the density of development in Washington, particularly around transit, is quite high. Um, and uh, there have been a number of studies done. If you were to take a, a conventional point tower and podium that you're getting in a lot of the 905 and compare that with some of the mid-rise in Washington around some other transit station, the density is almost identical. It's just in a different form. Um, so I think that's a, an important point to make, that you can deliver transit supportive densities in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, tall buildings are perfectly appropriate in certain contexts, as are mid-rise in, in other contexts. But the word that, that uh, I, I think you, you hit it on the head is transition. Um, and even areas, uh, again, I'll, 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 I'll highlight our neighbor to the south, Mississauga, who has unlimited height and density in their downtown. That doesn't apply right up to the existing single family areas. There's actually a height transition regime in place within uh, downtown Mississauga. So they don't get um, 40 story towers next door to a single family home. It actually forces that transition and that mid rise development to occur. And that, that's it along the eastern and western edges of, of their downtown. So that, that's something that we need to give consideration to, and, and we have policies in the plan that talk about respectful transition. Um, just again, you, you want to respect existing neighborhoods that allow density to come in. And again, there, there's a number of shapes and forms that we can deliver that density in. Uh, and again, it, it's quite appropriate to have a variety, um, all towers, mid-rise, et cetera. And I, I think the plan really sets up the ability to deliver. And if you remember that, um, the cross section that Andrea walked through, that, that's all shapes and sizes right up from the, the tall skyscrapers right down to single family homes. And that, that, that's what we envision uh, through the plan. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, and just, and just my apologies to clarify, what I meant incentivizing wasn't so much uh, the actual literal term, it was about opportunities for rezoning and, and having, uh, instead of the high density, having some areas carved out for that mid-rise to attract uh, those who can can uh, invest in that. And, and I guess my last point is uh, the importance of public, uh, the last question, importance of public spaces. Because one thing we talk about, and obviously we're, this is a roadmap for the future, but it's going to be critical that we have those places, those public spaces um, you know, notwithstanding green spaces and, and parks and so on, but just, you know, those public gathering places, because you could see uh, as we build that density, that's becoming even more critical. Uh, and, you know, just traveling through uh, Councillor Bo and myself and, and Wards 3 and 4 and, and uh, just those those meeting spaces, you know, and right now they're in the parks, but having sort of the ability, I'm really excited about the potential uh, on uh, steels across the shoppers world development, the real can development of having sort of that open public space and for gatherings for uh, uh, for just even uh, leisure, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and that I think really becomes a characteristic of a city when you go into, um, you know, having lived in a place like Rome and in places like Brussels, uh, as much as it was impressive, Brussels with uh, its institutionalized buildings, old historic buildings, the places I always loved were the little sort of, you know, city squares where there's like one or two cafes and, and, and they weren't sort of the predominant touristy ones, they were sort of like little sort of squares where, where people locally gathered. Absolutely, uh, and agree wholeheartedly with, with that comment. And, and I believe Councillor Dillon was talking about that as well. 
Uh, and this is part of the transition that, that Brampton is heading towards. It's becoming more urban, and uh, we've had great conversations with our parks planning group. Um, and I think they recognize that uh, the needs moving forward are, are potentially going to be a little bit different from the needs uh, so far. Um, probably less about building big sports fields and more about building those small piazzas and, and, and public meeting spaces. They all don't have to be publicly owned. Some of them can be privately owned and operated with public easements. Again, quite common around the world to do that. But in the urban areas of the plan, um, I think you can absolutely expect to see more of that because that, that goes hand in hand with urban life. And those create some of the most magical spaces in, in cities. But in addition to just, just parks, it's all of the hard and soft services that come with, with intensification. And we can't forget about that. Um, when you have a large subdivision, you think about schools and daycares and parks. We have to be thinking about all of that stuff with the big towers and the mid-rises, et cetera, to make sure that we're building complete communities um, and that we don't overlook that that quality of life because it's so important to the, the future of Brampton. But I absolutely agree. Um, and uh, I, I really I, I get excited about thinking about the future opportunities for Brampton with this urbanization and the intensification uh, and the quality of urban realm that, that we have the ability to to create here. It, it's quite exciting. Great, thank you. Um, our last speaker, uh, Councilor Fortini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, going back to, you know, the European women, I love that, you know, with the piazza, you go to parts of Germany, Portugal. The only issue I find, like, they have a rule, like, you can only build six stories or eight stories, and it's very hard to find the building 20 stories there. You won't find them like in Rome, Naples, anywhere like that. So when you have a piece of land, the, the developer kind of looks at it and knows what he could build, and that's the maximum you could go, and that's what that value piece is. The problem is we come to Brampton, we try to do the same thing, and it doesn't cover the cost. So uh, any developer says, well, I can't build something like this because the land is so high. So if you get, what you say, a place like Washington that has, that's all Washington. But if it were only considering a suburb like Brampton or a city like Brampton, people are just going to say, well, let me go to Georgetown. Let me go somewhere else because it doesn't cover the cost. So we have to look at maybe mixing it up, uh, looking at these bigger towers on the main roads where the transit line is and, and smaller towers where the homes are because, you know, I hate to put these big things in someone's backyard. But... Um, uh, I look when I just came like from Italy now, and it's all the buildings are all the same height, so that's where the value is, uh, and, and and there compared to us. So the market doesn't just cover that cost to build. So, and going back at these homes, like when we start building three thousand square foot homes, I was in an area today. I understand land's expensive, the backyard's small, but you can barely fit one car in the driveway. So, and we end up having these problems with that too. So we have to make make sure when we build these uh, communities uh, to accommodate a lot of the different issues. So. Yeah, that, I, absolutely. And, and through the chair, I, I agree wholeheartedly, Councillor Fertini. Uh, and, and what we've tried to do is, is lay out what, what we believe is, is a logical approach to height and density. Um, it, again, it, it's perfectly appropriate to have tall buildings in Brampton, um, but they shouldn't be everywhere. So we want to be clear about where they're appropriate and wh where we want to direct them to. We're suggesting the urban centers, downtown, uptown, Bramley, and perhaps the corridors, the transit corridors that connect those, is probably where you want to direct your tallest buildings. Um, town centers probably a little bit less in height. Um, and then, um, you know, your, your mid-rise buildings along some of these primary, secondary urban transit corridor routes. So I think there's a place for all of the, uh, all of what you've you've said, um, and and that that's just a good city to provide a, a variety of options. Councillor Badiros, you, you mentioned earlier, as you age, your needs change, um, and if we can provide a diversity of housing options in a variety of different neighborhoods, the goal should should be to allow people to age in their neighborhood. Um, and not have to relocate and move away from all their friends and their support network and have to go and move uh, somewhere else in Brampton or, or somewhere else in, in the GTA. So 
I, I think that is absolutely a goal, provide a variety of options that can include, again, there's nothing wrong with tall buildings. Uh, just want to be careful where we put them, um, make sure we can support them and deliver the support services, um, and that people can get around appropriately. Yeah, and I do agree on that. Uh, I, absolutely. You know, we can't just start putting these buildings anywhere uh, in people's backyards and stuff. Now, I mean, the main corridors, I think, you know, is the right where to do it. And, you know, looking at these places like Brussels, Germany, I've always, I said even for many years, times, you know, when you have these stores below and you have the pizzeria and you have the coffee shop, people just come down. You don't have to walk. A lot of places I've seen there, you know, you could just stop and get groceries. You just go upstairs, really, you know, in a little fridge just for emergency. Because it's not like us, they have a whole different lifestyle to what we do. We go on a, on a weekend and we do the shopping for the whole week. They do it day by day because they pass by there. The stores are open till late. It's a really good system they have. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, and, and if, if I could add, I, I think that's a, a really important point. It's about quality of life. And again, we're not trying to replicate Europe here. Um, but buying bread is a daily activity in, in a lot of European cities. So I think what we're trying to create is a, a city where we minimize the need to travel long distances to undertake your daily needs. And I think that will have a direct impact on quality of life. So that if you want to make bread buying a, a daily routine, you can. Uh, and hopefully you can do it without having to hop in the car. Um, you know, again, that's not going to be everywhere in Brampton, but there should be areas where you can do that. And sorry, I'll stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to take years, and those uh, those cities have been built years ago and walkable. But you also have to look at parts of Italy and Europe, you know, the earthquake and stuff. So it's very hard for them to build a 40 story building. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to staff again for uh, great work. And uh, I do have a motion moved by Councillor Fergini um, uh, that the report uh, titled uh, Draft Brampton Plan to Repeal and Replace the City of Brampton's Current Official Plan to the Planning Development Committee meeting of May 30th be received, uh, that the Building and Economic Development Department staff be directed to report back to Planning Development Committee with the results of the public meeting final recommendations and to receive uh, the correspondence. Uh, is there any, uh, and to receive the delegations as well. Is there anyone opposed? I see none. Motion carries. Uh, we'll now go on to Councillor Question Period. Are there any questions from uh, members of committee? I see none. Uh, public question period. Any questions from members of the public? City Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair, I do not see any questions online. I don't know if anybody in the chambers has a question. I don't see any, so there are no questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Our next uh, last item of business is adjournment. So, uh, committee is scheduled to meet uh, Monday, June 6th. I do have a motion by Councillor Bowman to adjourn tonight's meeting. Anyone opposed? I see none, and everyone have a great night, and thank you to staff again. Uh, great work today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of committee.